Greetings, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Dreamscapes. Today we have our friend Zane Landon out of California. He is a mental health advocate, publisher of the, oh my goodness, Positive Vibes magazine. Couldn't read my own handwriting. And he was also recently at the Youth Mental Health Action Forum at the White House. We'll definitely ask about that. Uh, it's a unique experience to get in there. Uh, you can find him at Zane Landon on uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Links in the description below. Uh, my housekeeping, would you kindly like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Always need more volunteer dreamers and viewers. Um, you can get a t-shirt like I'm wearing today. I try to remember to wear them on stream once in a while. Uh, also, uh, coffee mug, a variety of other little things through the stream store just to support the show. But the big deal is uh, first, BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, where you can find podcast episodes and uh, much more stuff. I'm working on a, an encyclopedia of um, sleep and dreams related historical figures and terms and research and stuff like that. Um, also, uh, as I said, downloadable MP3 podcast uh, things. And you can find the complete list of all 15 currently available works of historical dream literature. The most recent book, 15, The World of Dreams uh, by Havelock Ellis, uh, lovingly reproduced, highly uh, annotated, footnoted, indexed, cross-referenced, all that good stuff by yours truly. Put a lot of work into it, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. And that's enough about me. That's longer than I usually ramble about stuff. Back to, uh, back to our friend Zane. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate your time, and thanks for letting me be on your show. Good deal. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great place to start. The idea of the Youth Mental Health Action Forum at the White House. That was uh, pretty recently. The forum was in May. So, yeah, it was pretty recent, around five or six months ago. Opportunity happened. I saw it in, was it November, December of last year, of, of 2021. I discovered it because I was involved in a mental health organization called Active Minds. I mean, since I follow a lot of mental health People and advocates, I was going to find out about it eventually because I saw it all over LinkedIn and, and Instagram when it first came out because it was kind of a big deal that the White House was, you know, kind of putting this on. They weren't hosting. So they, I don't, no, I'm not 100% certain if they like planned it, but I know that MTV like were the main people hosting and planning mm. it. It was just going to be located at the White House, which was really cool. Uh, you know, I decided to apply because. Yeah, I always tell people apply, even if you don't think you're gonna get it, still hit that apply button because I, yeah, not think I would get it because I, I knew how passionate my generation is about mental health, and there's so many advocates that I, I kind of downplayed my experiences in a way, but I still applied, and you know, lucky enough, I got an email and I came in my spam folder, so I always tell people to check your spam because you never know. Oh yeah. So I checked my spam, and they said, "Oh, congratulations, you're a semifinalist." And I was like, "Okay." Uh, there's another step. <laughs> so there was another step, and they just had you fill out another application similar to the first one. It's a little more detailed, but not too detailed, actually. Um, I think they wanted to be simple, yet like organized in a way where it wasn't kind of it wouldn't be discriminatory, which is what can happen. So they didn't even have us do videos. It was literally just an application form. So it was pretty interesting. So yeah, the selection you know, like around a yeah, around a month later. Uh, you know, I was kind of just working that day or attending classes, whatever I was doing. I know my entire world dropped, though. I got the email that I was selected. Um, and I, I think it was interesting. It felt like the world stopped, but I still don't think it hit me till later. <laughs> just because you know, when you're in that moment, you forget what it could be because you're not thinking about that. I mean, I'm thinking about, I can't believe I got this. I'm not thinking about anything else. But then I forgot. I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a, I can't believe it's going to be at the White House. I can't believe I'm going to be able to meet these people, different advocates, as well as different leaders and officials at the White House. It's just something I never thought could be possible. And I think a lot of it is attributed to the work that I've done. Also, the digital magazine you mentioned, which I'll go into later. I think stuff like that is really what set me up to be selected for something like that. Mm. I position myself to be an advocate and place myself in all these different areas. Um, and always doing the work and always just being curious and being mindful of all those things. And the forum was just a great opportunity. The you know, the forum at first was, you know, an online thing. Like it was re it was like a remote boot camp where we're getting to know everyone, meeting people from the White House, um, as well as MTV. And I forgot to mention, there was also like several nonprofits involved in this too. Mm. Nonprofits like Born This Way, there's Lady Yaga's Foundation, there's like Active Minds, Jed Foundation, National Alliance on Mental Illness, like some you know, the biggest ones the until 
a lot of them that were and what's great about groups was they're also like mental health organizations that represented different communities not just like in general some of them so somewhere for like the asian collective or if it was for indigenous people to bring all the different perspectives from mental health communities which is what the point of this was not to just address youth mental health but what that actually means because the scope of youth mental health is millions of dimensions <laughs> so it makes yeah. sense that you know you bring in as many perspectives as you can so i did appreciate that it was so great so we did the remote boot camp and we, we were also like kind of designed to like create our own ideas it was almost like a pitch competition but we were not competing with each other mm. we kind of just brought forward ideas and we were going to bring forward ideas to media companies like pinterest spotify that were going to be at the forum so that was the chunk of the remote and then Finally, you know, the forum happened, and then we went to Washington, D.C. We were all flown there um, and went by fast. I mean, we were kind of preparing for where it was going to be, and then got there Monday, and then Wednesday happened, which was the actual forum itself at the White House, <laughs> which was nerve-wracking. I don't I mean, you know how to feel in that moment. You're just sitting yeah. there going through it and then seeing what it's like in there. You're, like, you're just absolutely amazed and how... Beautiful everything is, um, and also how simple things are. And then, you know, when you get there, you're like thinking, "Oh my goodness, the amount of people that have been in here, the decisions made here, like you know how history hasn't been impacted in this in this yeah. place." You know, they had they had paintings, statues of Abraham Lincoln, and all stuff. Like imagine him being there, and you're there. It's interesting, uh, really interesting feeling. Oh yeah, even just kind of like waiting there, you're just everyone's excited, but. I, there was like a point where I was just like, uh, I don't think, <laughs> just kind of be in that moment because it's like it's happening right now. It's going to be gone like that, and it was <laughs> definitely yeah. ended a lot faster than I thought it would. Because that's how things work. So you, that's why I always like tell people like when you're in that moment, like just breathe, um, don't get caught up in it because you want to appreciate the moment because it will end fast, and, it, and it's good. You have you have the memories, you have reflection that you can get, but like appreciate how far you've come like give yourself that I, I did do that and it was it was nice and i got to meet people like selena gomez because she was like the keynote person and you know she's had her fair share of mental health and she came up with a documentary recently about her mental health journey too so it was cool to have someone there actually represent mental health in an authentic way that was that's also like an influencer and in a in a like a celebrity that was really cool because i don't I think more people are open to it now, but still, there are many people that are closed about it. But she's always been really open, which I respect a lot. And then we got to meet other people like Dr. Murthy, the Surgeon General, Dr. Biden, the First Lady. After the forum, after the event, um, we were waiting in like the waiting room again. And so President Biden did show up, which was really cool. <laughs> None of us were expecting that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know everybody has different opinions of the president and the administration. But just the idea of being next to the president, like five feet away. You still meet the president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's just an amazing feeling. Yeah. Uh, an unbelievable one. It really felt euphoric. It really did. I remember um, I remember him like walking in. None of us were looking that way because everyone was talking and stuff. I remember looking and I saw him and I was like, kind of looks familiar. No, I'm just kidding. I knew who it was. But, I, but at first I was like, he looks really familiar. Like, is that actually him? I don't think that's really him. I can imagine being in disbelief for a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, no way that's him. Because like everyone was like, Biden's not coming. Everyone was like, no, he probably won't come. Like, he's coming. Just you manifest with me. Because <laughs> I think he'll be coming. You know, there's no <laughs> way. Um, I don't even act, but to be honest with you, I don't think he was supposed to be there because everyone was shocked for one and he didn't have a lot of time. He spent like probably like 15 minutes with us. So I think that, um, he actually probably wasn't supposed to be there, which I think was great that he was then. Uh, so yeah, that was it. A really incredible opportunity. And I am still connected to the people who attended. And now I have a network with all these foundations and TV, even Selena Gomez's company i got to attend one of their events it was a queer event which was pretty cool to talk to and it was pretty like collective like it was only like a couple 20 30 people were there so really great opportunities coming up from it um, and still happening just grateful that the opportunity existed and i hope they continue doing it yeah 
That is very cool. The whole story. I didn't want to interrupt. I had a you know a bunch of questions, but you addressed most of them, like who was there and kind of how did it work. And uh, I mean, great, great story. If you're if you're telling the story well, I don't need to add anything to it. Um, <laughs> I was curious to know, you know, so you did the kind of the pitch boot camp beforehand, kind of focus ideas and uh, let the best most potentially successful ideas come to the surface. And then when you got there, there was a chance to then pitch those top ideas. And did, 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 um, do you remember anything about what those top ideas were about how to improve engagement, understanding, um, screening to help people get help if they need it? I don't know if any of that stuff stood out to you. Did. Yeah, no, I love seeing everybody's ideas and that happened. So after the white house portion, we went back to had this hub that we were at and it was like this building that they, I think rented and yeah it was basically like a, it was a nice dinner and there was representatives from there from every all the nonprofits for one even like trevor project so many and um, but then they had people from spotify youtube Pinterest. um pinterest had a huge a stake in the forum which was really cool mm -hmm. i didn't know pinterest was it's probably because i didn't know but i didn't know that pinterest uh they really care a lot about wellness, which was something I was excited to see. Kind of makes sense to me in terms of even like their, uh, their business <laughs> business model in a sense of like, I bet their market share, so to speak, of inspirational poster pictures right. <clears throat> is huge. So that's like a place people go to express themselves, but also to seek uplifting things. Uh, I, you know, I don't see a lot of negativity or, or hurtful stuff, so to speak, on uh on Pinterest seems to be very motivational, yeah. uplifting, positive energy. Oh yeah. And it makes sense. It's just, you still never know what a company's culture is really like, Yeah, but it was great that they hope, cause I didn't mention this, but like Tuesday before the forum, Pinterest hosted this dinner at the Smithsonian, which was really cool. And there was so many people there. I mean, there's probably like maybe 200 people there, which is a lot from what they were probably trying to do. Cause it was like more of a smaller event. Like they had panelists and like people who worked at, Pinterest and just how open they were about their experiences in a room of people they don't know, but also people they work closely with, it's kind of scary. So I commended the people that I had speak about content inspiration and like being open about their mental health. That was really cool. That was just something I really enjoyed seeing and transparency, other employees' well being, all of it. It just kind of was a breath of fresh air, and I'm hoping more companies follow that. Oh, wait, I didn't finish. And then Wednesday, so Wednesday after the White House, we went back, and that's where we actually presented the pitches. I love what everybody had to say. You know, it was, the point was to kind of connect storytelling with mental health. How do we actually do that? Mm -hmm. Some campaigns that I, you know, that I remember were like Hidden Healers, which they're actually doing a real campaign right now with, with MTV, trying to bring cultural awareness to mental health practices, a way to embed the two, like embracing multicultural mental health. Sometimes we don't see that. And then I remember... Was a, I don't remember the campaign name, but their campaign was about creating like some sort of uh, where you create your own avatar and you're like a superhero, but your superpower is supposed to be your mental health or your disability um, or just your identities. And I remember it was like called Broken and Broken with the OK was capitalized because you may be broken how society views you. Mm. You're OK yourself. You just you're not viewed that way, though, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's something very powerful in the idea of saying everyone has struggles and they're going to be different yeah. for everyone, but you're no one's going to be exempt from that rule. And there's a there's a, a great need for that kind of compassion and saying, you know, I'm not perfect either. Uh, and so I'm not going to expect that from someone else and a level of acceptance with that as well of saying, um, you know, we're kind of on this crazy ride together and we can make it better for each other or we can make it more miserable than it really needs to be. Uh, and I'm always yeah. leaning on that side of being more helpful and more um, inspirational and compassionate and whatnot. That's it's definitely my brand, Bene benevolence, uh, trying to do good out of whatever I'm doing. So, yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just my way. Um, so that was a whole, that was a whole experience. And so he spent multiple days there. I know the focus of it is that, that brief time that went by in a flash at the white house, but there was other stuff at dinner at the Smithsonian. Um, yeah. Any other kind of events that happened around that time or during the visit? Most of it was just practicing. <laughs> so a lot of the event, like Monday, we really didn't do anything because 
wanted to give us that time, which I love. My goodness, I love Get that every single, part the, yeah. or the, every single part of the every single part of the event just bled mental health. Like this is exactly what we need to see events do. It's exactly what we need to how we can make events better. And one of the things that I thought was amazing was at the event itself, they had on-site psychologists. So mm-hmm. if there was a moment where one of us needed to just see one immediately, they had a couple on site that were available, which I think you know, not everybody has the means to do this, but I would love to see big conferences or events where there are on site psychologists because mm-hmm. you never know what's going to happen. And you could be overwhelmed by something you witnessed, or maybe something happens in your personal life that you can't understand or you're having trouble understanding it or you're having trouble processing it and you need some sort of professional to kind of help you, you know? Sure. Well, and then just the process of, uh, the travel itself. I mean, physically the travel, the flight, the, the, and the stress of being out of your element and in a new place you've never been before. You don't know where anything is. Everything takes a lot of mental bandwidth to kind of process what's happening. I need to know Um, where I'm going. I need to find my flight, find my car, find my hotel, I need to find my group. I need to know my schedule. There's this whole pre and then you've got to be at certain places at certain times. And you're meeting with it's, it's one of those things where it's like exciting and terrifying at the same time, just a whole ball of wax. Uh, one of the reasons that, you know, I've been to a few conferences like that and I've traveled a little bit, but I don't like it. I like to stay in my little, little cave here and never go anywhere. So the idea of like, you're telling me this story and I'm like, I'm so happy for you. I would never go. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing any of that, <laughs> but I'm glad it was good for you. You know, like not my style. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I resonate what you're saying a lot. Cause every single time I had the opportunity to travel, I get really bad anxiety. I'm telling you Yeah. before the forum, like Sunday, cause I was leaving at like 12 at night. I remember like that whole day I was panicking the whole day. And they had us test. They had us test if we were going to get COVID. Like, I had to like test on camera in the COVID test. I kid you not. This is such a bad thing to think, but I was like, if I have COVID, I'm not going to be sad about it. <laughs> it was a weird thing. It was a weird thing because I was like, I really don't want to go, and it wasn't because I didn't want to go. It's because yeah. it was kind of like just letting those anxieties and fears trump basically the rationale at that point. And I was like, yeah point where like i wanted to go badly but also i didn't but i, I was lucky that nothing stopped me and i'm glad nothing let I'm glad nothing did because uh i was gonna stop myself i was lucky that people encouraged me to push me to go because i was pretty <laughs> scared to go <laughs> no i feel you there's a a comedian put it this way is like there's there's nothing like the tremendous relief of canceled plans at the last moment i'm free i don't have to worry about this anymore i don't have to deal with it there's a disappointment factor too uh depending on how how much you really did kind of want to go, even though you're also, and sometimes you get to write out the anxiety and say, you know, this is worth it. This is something important. Uh, the anxiety is not going to kill me. It's, I will be uncomfortable, so to speak, but uh, I will not be, my life will not be threatened by this experience. So, and then, and then conquering it, going through with it and saying, you know, I'm glad I did it. That was, that was good. It was good for me. It was a good experience in general. So I'm glad I did. Um, I've had those moments too. Like I didn't want to go and I'm like, oh, okay, it's fine. It was good. I enjoyed it sort of mostly <laughs> you know for me because uh, i don't want to say this for other people mm. i think it's good to kind of embrace being uncomfortable oh yeah but i understand that some people who are uncomfortable that's okay if you don't want to explore that but for some people i think it's good to explore to explore that potential growth that you might experience because also i don't want to be in a place where i have a doubt not a doubt sorry i have a regret because if i didn't mm-hmm. go to the forum 100 percent regret there's no way i wasn't going to have a regret i think like about what's really gonna challenge you with in a good way and what's really gonna help you grow as a leader or a person or be a kinder person whatever it is um and also think how you're going to think about it if you don't go you don't want those regrets because then that will kind of linger on for a long time or almost your whole life yeah that and that comes down to some of those pat or trite aphorisms you know things like you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take sometimes Mm -hmm. you just gotta give it a try and see what happens um but you said something else too where it's like it's good to challenge yourself to be a little uncomfortable and there's um a a concept that has come back to my mind uh recently the uh, zone of proximal growth and uh, the, the best way to describe it is probably you don't start off 
day one training for a marathon by running the entire marathon on day one. No, you start off taking a walk, then you take a jog, then you jog a little further, then you jog a little faster. Otherwise, you know, it's like going to the gym and say, I'm going to bench press 600 pounds. You're not, I'm not, nobody is on day one. You start off with the lower weights and you challenge yourself to get stronger as you go. And I, I think it translates well into psychology as well. And it's, but it is very personal. It's very, um, it has to be tailored to the individual and where they're at. And, you know, so for one person challenging themselves might be of something very small. And for another person, it might be a lot bigger because that's what they're ready for at that moment. So, uh, just great, just great. Those general concepts to, to kind of explore them and have them, have them spelled out a little bit. Um, my, my two yeah. Friends. And like you said, <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, and like you, like you said, everyone's at a different place and that's why I don't, I don't judge. I don't blame people that don't decide to pursue something or if they're uncomfortable because they're not in a place where they think that'll help them. And if they firmly believe that, then that's what's going to help them the most. And that's no right for me to tell them or yeah. intervene at all. It can be dangerous you know? too to kind of push people into things they're not ready for, really not ready right. for. And there's, I don't know, it's, and it's very tough. That's why, you know, I don't. I dispense general concepts I believe are true, but I don't dispense advice to anyone necessarily, you know, generally good to challenge yourself. True. Very much unique to the individual. True. Right. Um, so it's one of those things where, and then if it's coming from the outside, I mean, that's something you got to work out and really know the, the person who's giving you that advice, who's giving you that encouragement saying, I think you can do more than you are now for your own sake. Uh, are they, are they someone you trust and they're looking out for your best interest? Okay. Let's say they are, are they right? Is their assessment accurate? Uh, and sometimes people are self-motivated. Like I want to see you accomplish more and maybe it's for your sake, but also it's their feeling too of like, I wish you were better. I'd be happy uh, if you were better as well. So sometimes there's a selfish motivation from other people, which, you know, and partly is they don't want to see you suffer. Maybe they, they think if you grow in a certain way, you'll have a better life. Fair enough. But also it's hard to watch people suffer. So there's a, a resonance we get to when we're looking at someone like, God, I wish I could help them get better. And then sometimes we push too hard, too fast. And that can be its own kind of mistake. Yeah. And oh, there's so many, so many dynamics to think about. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I also don't <laughs> depending on, you know, what is the motivation, but you know, for parents that want to see their kids grow or their kids do amazing things like that. Don't, Unless, depending on what their motivations are, if it's just they're they're hounding these expectations onto them, you know, that could be that. But you know, I don't see anything wrong with that either. You know, wanting your your loved ones to grow and to challenge themselves in a good way. So it's interesting, all of that. Yeah, no, that's a big that's a big struggle, especially yeah, parents and kids, because you you would assume, mm. and I do, that most parents want their kids to succeed for the kids' own sake, not really for their own ego. Even though there's a part of that, you're like, that's my boy, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, <laughs> right. But then, you know, are they, are their expectations reasonable, man? Parents beat themselves up about that too. Of like, you know, should I have pushed harder? Should I have backed off? Uh, that's a, that's a process to learning, learning that as well. Um, I don't know. I, I, I have that kind of perspective, compassion for, depending on the angle I look at it, I can almost understand anything, why someone did something, even if I disagree with it. Okay. Well, it made sense to them from that angle. Fair enough. Um, and try to be a little understanding on that. Even when I say, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, like, I understand maybe why you want to. I think that's a bad idea, that kind of thing. Um, but I did want to ask you as well, V, uh, about your Positive Vibes magazine. So you already had that going before you got the invitation. That was part of your uh, bonus. Yeah, I, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I started Positive Vibes magazine of May of 2020. So, yeah. Uh, yeah very long, not like, super long, but, you know, like a year and a half um, to when, you know, the forum was first kind of announced. Started it because I was actually taking a university class on copy editing uh, or copywriting. I can't remember the exact one. It's yeah. copy editing. Yeah, I remember now. And going through the class, yeah, it was, it was a cool class. And then at the end, we had to create our own publication. And the professor had, like, certain, like, articles that he said, are they going to be aligned with your journal? You tell me why you would accept them or not. I was like, okay. So I wanted to do a um, whole publication on like urban legends and UFOs. I thought that would be pretty cool and exciting. That is fascinating stuff. Yeah. It is. <laughs> but I decided to not because it needed to be completely non fictional. Mm. Um, and depending on 
<laughs> I think that stuff is non-fictional, <laughs> but I don't think the professor did. So I decided to take a different route and really think about what I wanted to see. And we were kind of at the beginning of the pandemic still. And so I was thinking, like, what platform would people want to see? And so I thought it would be really interesting to do a platform based on mental health storytelling but from a more positive angle. Um, sometimes I don't see that. Yeah. Where people share their vulnerable truths or they they'll share themselves. Um, but they're only encouraged to share the bad stuff and not the inspirational person they've become. Not just inspirational because they carry these identities, but because of what they've accomplished despite these barriers that they you know, that they've had to experience. I love seeing that and seeing like a transformation happen. So I wanted to see more of that. I decided to, you know, go through the project now was having my friend review it. Um, and I just kind of had just a moment where I thought, what's wrong with us starting something like this? It would be interesting to start something like this because I would like to see it. I would like to see more mental health storytelling in that aspect. We decided to actually start it, like for real. <laughs> so we started off with just on social media because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how to build a website. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. So I thought, let's just start in social media. And that's where people were kind of staying connected right now anyways through the pandemic. We were just kind of sharing postings about different things, about like crystal healing and like different things that can bring positivity into people's lives. And then everything changed one day when we had a, an actual person uh, who wanted to share their story with us and do an actual interview. Because <laughs> I didn't know, I really didn't think we would do that. I thought we would just, it would be a typical blog where we're writing about mental health topics. But we decided to kind of actually pursue it because an amazing opportunity to share someone's voice and then after we did that we decided to focus on that and then we had a lot of people reaching out through the whole thing i've worked with several PR firms i've worked with several influencers amazing people people who have gone through a lot of stuff um you know even people who have experienced sexual assault or people who are involved in gangs like talking to people like that seeing them at a you know a really dark moment or dark moments and then what they do now, which is be successful, inspire the world through their stories. I love seeing that. And that's exactly what we still do today. That was the, the crux of the magazine. That's what I've been doing since. And as I said, since I've done it, I've been placed in so many areas of working with PR firms, working with even spiritual leaders, because that, that was a started getting to the we tapped into like the more of the spiritual stuff, which is really cool. We just it wasn't purposeful. I didn't say Let's interview spiritual leaders. No, it just was a PR firm reached out about spiritual leaders that they re represented. We featured one or two, and then we had a bunch of spiritual leaders come out and say, I would like to share my story. It's really cool how that worked. Um, and that kind of, that helped me too, because it helped me realize my spiritual identity, question what I believed, kind of go back to that place, because I was always kind of interested in different spiritualities and religions, but I hadn't explored it. So a lot of Personal transformations have happened through the magazine for myself as well, not just the people you get to feature. So that's what we've been doing. I think it helped the most in being able to attend that you know event at the White House because before that, I was passionate about mental health and I was involved in some organizations, but nothing like that. Where again, like I said, I placed myself in so many areas and learned so much about like the breadth of mental health and you know variety of it and the diversity of it that I didn't know too much before. Because really going out there and interviewing people, you learn so much from what people go through and their advice and their experience. And I'm grateful for every interview I get to do because every single time I um, I feel different and I feel more enlightened because it's not that and it's not even it's not even like they have some like sometimes their advice is things I've heard of, but like the way they say it and the way they picture it or the way they analyze it. I'm like I didn't I've heard this advice, but the way you're putting it is so interesting. But for me, um, I am changed a little bit every single time I have an interview. <laughs> no, I, I actually feel the same way. And it seems like you and I, I mean, maybe not at exactly the same time, but we both started back in uh, about 2020-ish. Mm. And I've done now, I mean, this will be uh, episode 104. Uh, I've done, yeah, about, you know, well, well over 100 uh, interviews. And I've changed in that process, too. I mean, my understanding and listening to people and... Um, in engaging with them where they're coming from. And there's always unique 
conversational elements, like my conversation with you is going to be different from the one I had last week with, with another guy, because you're coming from a different place. You got different ideas. It's a different, um, different dynamic that just happens based on what we're both interested in and how one idea connects to another. Um, yeah. so yeah, I, so I definitely resonate with that idea of, of having changed myself across this journey. Definitely got more comfortable talking on the microphone. I no longer get the, um, uh, the, what do they call it? stage, stage fright, the pre pre-show jitters. Like ah, I've done this a hundred times, literally I can say that. <laughs> so <laughs> just kind of relax and be goofy and, and, and not worry about how I'm presenting myself or, um, I think I have, sometimes I have a resting bitch face. It looks like, <laughs> it looks like I'm not <laughs> happy with what's being said. I'm just kind of neutral. I'm just listening. I got no expression. So I hope it, hope it doesn't come across like I'm angry or disinterested. Uh, but then I try not to think about that because as I was saying, you know, the experience, but um, enough about me. I was actually using that as a jumping off point to go back to um, ask how many interviews you've been able to accomplish. And if you had certain, what am, what am I trying to say? Like you were saying before, the idea of a lot of people focus on mental health from the negative side. Here's my struggles. Here's the worst things that happened to me. Here's how it makes my life difficult. We don't often hear a lot of stories about here's how I fixed that problem in my life in my unique way. Here's success stories that people could emulate or draw inspiration from. So I love that idea. And if it's, you know, of course, great name, positive vibes. It's like, this isn't about look at how miserable it is. It's like, you can pull yourself out of it in, in this way, like I did, or at least learn from my example in some way that might be useful to you. Um, so that, that threw a lot at you there. I'll let you respond. Sorry. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, because it just made me think, you know, the, uh, I'm sure you've heard the term toxic positivity. Oh. That's what we're. That's what we're. We're totally opposite of that. We are not advocating for that because it's not mm. going to help anyone. Yeah. And so we're. We, even though it's called positive vibes, we're not the positive vibes only. <laughs> we don't say positive vibes only. I think. I think it was a time where I was. I was playing that as the hashtag, but I stopped because I, it's not helpful. And also, it's like completely counterintuitive to what we were trying to accomplish. That you know, if you want to be truthful and you want to transform cannot transform without going through a struggle or an experience where there's no transformation then that's how i experience it like you know it's not necessarily like bad to good or good to bad but it's just saying like you know whatever dynamic you're going through whatever it is that you're going through you know to transform something had to have changed and change is always hard so that's what i'm getting at that you know change and you know going through struggles like you said even i think we talked about before these are inevitable um, so don't try and only put your mind through positivity and not confront your actual emotions or what you're actually feeling. Because, again, that's just going to – that just may make you worse off. It might not help your growth at all. Um, I say growth like, you know, like maturity because, you know, we're not always growing. We don't have to always be growing. I feel like there's also that concept where you know, it's something you have – you always have to take a lesson from something. You always have to learn from something. <laughs> I'm learning my, I'm learning now I don't agree with that because some there's no point to the lesson at all. You know, like when someone has to go through something traumatic, they tell people your advice shouldn't be at least you're a stronger person because while that sounds nice, I think that's for them to decide, not for you to say to them. And like when I, I do believe that everything happens for a reason, I'm never gonna tell someone that mm. under their circumstances. Because whatever they're going through, I'm not gonna go and tell them a stronger person now so you should appreciate what you do have i don't like that either like when you go and say it's nice again this is stuff that you should personally think about though like when you say someone that you should you should have gratitude for what you have yes i mean that's nice but again it's not fair to put that on someone who may be at a different place and if your response is have gratitude or appreciate what you have because they're they're Showing their emotions to you or they're showing what they've gone through and that's your response you're kind of like saying it doesn't matter it's not important and i understand you have good intentions but i think the only thing this is what i think i think the most important thing you can do for someone is just be there for them show up for them just listen to them like, i yep. think a lot of people have problem with that <laughs> and i think the problem is is like a lot of people are fixers a lot of people want to solve problems. A lot of people want to, they don't want to see their friends struggling, so they're going to offer their solutions or their advice. That might not work. That actually may not, that actually might some away from you. 
because you're kind of pushing your narrative onto them and what you want them to do. If they want advice, that's different. But I think you really need to hear them out. I think the most empowering thing you can do is just listen to them and be there for them. Even if it's like a moment of silence. I, I feel like we always want things to be a certain way. It's nice to have someone that is just there, that just sits there or is there when you need them. Because at the end of the day, it's their decision, it's their life. Um, and I think that that's the best tools you can give them. Is I feel like sometimes when you're in those moments, you don't even know what you want. You don't even know how to communicate your feelings sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's like just being there for them is what's important. Oh, I know. I know people give great advice. <laughs> I know that you know people have amazing tips or you know, offer words of support. But I think the most important thing is just be there for what they need. So yeah. that's what I would say about that for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, that great great thing is there is there um, balance in all things. I'm a big fan of the yin yang type of thing, and there is such a thing as too much positivity that toxic positivity you're talking about the example that popped into my mind was the kind of i, I hadn't really thought of it before when i came across this but there was a guy uh, possibly a comedian I, I love comedians stand-up philosophers i call them great thinkers uh, most of them and he said you know everyone says you got to stay positive when you got cancer positive it's all gonna work out winning the fight all that good stuff and he's like no i want to be angry fuck cancer that's my coping skill and i'm like that's right. If you need to be angry about this and that gives you strength and you're going to be negative and curmudgeonly and whatever gets you through it, you know, maybe the other people around you are like, I get it. You're angry. Not so loud, but at least it isn't that, that saccharine, sweet, forced, positive framing that, yeah. you know, this, this, there's a very, and nothing's wrong with either approach, but, but it was definitely right. to say that this seems to be what most people conceive of as the only way to get through this. And so the guy was like, I'm gonna mm. do it my way. And he did. And he's alive today, you know, and that, that opened my eyes to that idea of there's more than one way to get there. There's different paths to the same destination for different people based on the circumstances and what works better for them. So. That's, oh, that's a great example. And no, I agree. I mean, Whatever's going to work for the person. And again, I think if you're putting that expectation on someone on how they can heal or how they can go through cancer, whatever it is, and that's just not what's going to work for them. It might mm -hmm. make the experience so much worse than what it should be. So yeah, he was I, not feeling it. It was like, screw this positivity hey. shit. That's not working for me at all. And it wasn't. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was a pretty cool eye opener. Um, well, we, we chatted for about half an hour. I want to be respectful of your time and, uh, and get to the, uh, more or uh, not more but also other interesting stuff um you feel about ready to jump into jump into the dream material uh very cool let me make a little note here for myself i've gotten better about doing timestamps. Benjamin the Dream Wizard wants to help you pierce the veil of night and shine the light of understanding upon the mystery of dreams. Every episode of his Dreamscapes program features real dreamers gifted with rare insight into their nocturnal visions. New Dreamscapes episodes appear every week on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and other video hosting platforms, as well as free audiobooks highlighting the psychological principles which inform our dream experience and much, much more. To join the wizard as a guest, reach out across more than a dozen social media platforms and through the contact page at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, where you will also find the wizard's growing catalog of historical dream literature, available on Amazon, featuring the wisdom and wonder of exploration into the world of dreams over the past 2,000 years. That's Benjamin the Dream Wizard on YouTube and at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. So I can find, find what I'm doing here. So, uh, my basic process, I just shut up and listen. You tell me the dream, we'll go back through it again, pull out a few more details. And then, uh, between the two of us, we're going to put something together that, uh, that makes sense. So I'm ready when you are. Should I give context before though? You can sure. So this dream is about my mom and the context is passed away in January of 2021. Um, it was a hard time. I never lost some... I mean, I've experienced grief before, but not to that severity. And I still experience it now because I think it's a forever journey. I don't remember exactly when I had the dream, but 
was, I think, a couple months ago. It was very clear. Almost like I was lucid dreaming. Like, I was clear. I felt like I was in control of my actions, everything. And I remember... Mom was still alive, and I knew it. And she was in the other room. And it's so interesting, because every time I have these dreams about my mom, I know she's going to pass away. It's really interesting. It's I can never be in that place where my imagination lets me have my mom still alive, and there's nothing that's going to take that away. But every time, it's always, I know she's going to pass, so I find it always interesting. Um, and so I knew she was going to pass, and so, of course, I was had that weight on my shoulders. I remember my mom was calling for me in the bedroom, and I don't remember what happened. I remember me walking in, and she was just very upset, visibly sounding really upset. And then she told me to come near her, and so I did. And I held her, um, with both my hands, like this. And so, the way I'd never held my mom's face like that. And then, she told me to kiss her. And so, I did. And then, woke up. And that was it. And it was a very different feeling. A very ominous, but also very peaceful. I woke up, like a very nice woke up. Like, I, I knew I was waking up. <laughs> and I woke up, and I kind of just sat there, or laid there, for like 20 minutes. Like, oh my gosh, like what, just, like what just happened? I've had dreams that, where stuff like that happened, but for the way I felt was so different. Um, this is, I'm going to say this about dreams, because for me... <laughs> I think dreams can be a gateway. That's what I think. I think they can be a gateway to afterlife or different dimension, whatever. Like, I don't know. I think it could be really interesting how it works. But for me, I thought that that felt like a sign. I don't know what sign. But it was very comforting. To the point where I felt like my mom was at peace and I was with her. Again, in a way I hadn't felt in any dream or any daydream or any imagination I've ever had. Well, of course, when she was alive, yeah. You know, after she passed, I never felt that. So I thought it was really interesting. So that's kind of my dream. Okay, very cool. Um, and dreams don't have to be long, and we'll we'll get something out of it. Um, lots of great details in there, and believe it or not, we're going to find more as we go through it. You cannot sharpen your claws on my paper. You got to go. Look at this one. <laughs> You're so cute, but I ain't got time for cats right now. This is baby. <laughs> we call her baby. Actually, our um, niece, uh, my wife and I, when, when, when her niece was little, um, she loved Justin Bieber. And that was one of uh, one of the words she was learning when she was very young. And so she looked at this cat and said, baby. And that's been her name ever since. <laughs> How cute. You got to go. You got to go. I'm doing a show. Come on. Come on. Okay. You don't want to get picked up. Good. Walk over <laughs> okay so usual process shut up and listen and we go back through uh for a second pass i call the deep dive um where were you located at the beginning of the dream in your room in the living room outside the house i believe i was in the hallway do you have any Recollection of what you were doing in the hallway. You were on your way somewhere to do something, passing from one oh. room to another. Probably. I really didn't feel like I was doing anything at all. Okay. So just kind of present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a problem. Um, and this was recognizably your house or her house. Yes. Uh, yeah. which, which one was it? Um, did you live with your mom when she passed or you'd been out for a while and you went back to your childhood home in the dream? Um, oh, I've been in the same house. So, <laughs> so yeah, the house I'm in now, my mom's house or my house or my family's house. But yeah, this house. Yep. Recognizably. Okay. Fair enough. And if you had to give a an indication of where you were relative to her room, like were you at 
a far point in the hallway away from it or actually very close and it was just around the corner? Pretty close. Like I was in the, like the middle of the hallway and it's not a long hallway. That would have probably have been like four feet away from the door. Okay. Or eight feet, sorry. <laughs> and then you heard her, uh, oh, and y- even before you heard her call call you, call call to you, um, even just existing at that moment of uh, uh, in the hallway, you already had this feeling that she was, she wouldn't be with you. She was going to. Yes. Okay. And I, I don't know why. It wasn't like new. No, it's not. I didn't know about the specific illness or whatever it was, but I was just like, I always know in these dreams. And oh, I remember even uh, this is going on a different dream, but just to share. Sure. I did have a dream where my mom was there, and we were all just like hanging out at a bookstore. And I asked her, "I'm like, what are you doing here?" <laughs> it was a very weird dream, but I was like, like an emotional way, I was like, "What are you doing here? I'm not supposed to be here." It was a really weird feeling. So yeah, in all these dreams, I'm always well aware that she isn't supposed to be here. I'm grateful she is, and then either that or you know she's gonna go soon interesting yeah that's why i was trying to get the um Mm. timeline down in terms of the sequence of events it was before Mm. she called you that you knew she would pass soon it wasn't after she called to you and you were surprised because she was supposed to have already do you see what i'm trying to say i'm I'm not phrasing it no i do no i was not surprised at all no like i i felt like that was always in the back of my head even when right when it started in the I already knew. Okay. And those are kind of two separate ideas. The idea that um you'd be surprised she'd be there because she had already passed and you're thinking, what? And the other side of it is knowing she's gonna go soon, not being surprised by that knowledge, but uh, also not being surprised that she called out to you, even knowing there was gonna be a a parting soon. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, trying to wrap my head around the ideas there. Um, so what what do you recall her saying? Or was it more of a without words type of thing in, in a way? Like not without words. words. I think felt nonverbal. Like I don't even remember if she said my name, but I just kind of felt drawn to it because I heard her. Um, and then like crying or moaning or whimpering, whatever it was. I never... You no, know, I think I mentioned when I first said this to you, like the dream, like she told me she well, I mean she did it she did tell me to kiss her at the end. That I do. But other than that, I don't remember anything else of any conversation. It all it was all very silent and nonverbal. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of dreams are that way too. And I, I tell this to people as well that seeing the image of something is the same as simply knowing something. They they have the same quality in a place that isn't physical, so to speak. It's uh, a very strange place, our imagination, where, you know, if you imagine someone speaks, you may not actually in your head hear words, but you can, but you can, you know, they're speaking, you can watch their lips move and you know, sounds coming out, even if you're not hearing it, so to speak. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, and most people describe um, visions, sounds are next, and then very low on the total pull is um, touch, smell, and taste. Very, very, very far down. Interesting mm. distinction that, uh, you know, I guess we're primarily visual and auditory. We get a lot of our input about the world through those things, and we use touch next most often, certainly, but we don't often use taste or smell unless we're eating, which is very important or, you know, um, de- determining other things that require smell, but it's less useful, less functional. What am I trying to say? Useful is a good way to put it. I mean, it's tremendously useful, but it's like we use vision and sound orders of magnitude more in, in daily life. So those get, those become the strongest, strongest impressions. Um, mm. so you kind of did hear, maybe some crying or a whimpering noise. But even before that, you felt that she was calling out to you in a way that was nonverbal. Uh, okay. Being drawn somewhere. Yeah. Drawn. Gotcha. Um, so you round the corner and what do you see? What's the scene? She's sitting in a chair, sitting on the bed, standing in a corner. 
Yeah, I didn't say that. She was kind of like sitting on the bed, sitting like on the corner, like hunched over. Any details of the room? Uh, anything you can describe it? I mean, it was just it was just dark. It was just dark except her that I could see, but there was no light or anything. Okay. Any um, impression of how she was dressed? Um, Probably like in all black pajamas, something like that. Okay. It was like she just got out of bed. Probably, I didn't say that. Okay, that is a that is a feeling you're having now, looking at the scenes. Like it feels like she just got out of bed. Right. Yeah. And I, I didn't mention this either, because um, I don't know. Maybe when I woke up, that's when she passed in the dream. Who knows? But it felt like she knew she was going to pass very soon. You know what I mean? Like if it kind of felt like that. So you, uh, in your mind, the um, crying, whimpering noise. She's. Uh sad about that knowledge sad about that sad about leaving yeah okay um did she you said she was hunched over that's the posture and then did she change her posture when you when you came in she sat up and did you make any gestures or did I mean, well, she was hunched over yeah. when I came. She, of course, looked at me looking up more a bit. Um, yeah. And I guess after that, I just kind of held her face with my hands. Um, and then I think we just, it was like we were there for a little bit. And then she asked me again to kiss her. And then I did. And I just woke up. Okay. So she looked up kind of from a hunch position and, um, mm -hmm. I, I wrote down that, that you felt like she said she wanted you to come near. Is that also mm -hmm. kind of more of a feeling or you, you have more of an impression at this point that she did actually speak? No. The only thing that she said was just asking for the kiss and that's it. But gotcha. um, yeah. nope, it just felt like that. I was being called to and also just obviously me wanting to go comfort her. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Gotcha. Um, so you did, and she's sitting on the edge of the bed. You're standing as you walk into the room. Did you kneel down to her level, or did you mm -hmm. take her hands in your face from standing? Um, just standing. As she hunched over, I was just standing there, so I was, like, over her. Never changed, really, my posture, except maybe lean a bit down, but that was kind of it. I didn't kneel or anything. And I, I don't know if you mentioned this or if I'm misremembering it, like that's not a typical gesture you would have made in real life, taking her face in your hands or, or is it? Uh, oh, never. Okay. There's, um, I mean, my mind goes to, there's iconic representations of that as a, you know, certainly in, in media of, of being the, the tender gesture, like you want to express something to someone that you care about them. You, you know, you don't grab their face, but you, but, but you hold it. And yeah. because they're precious to you, there's, there's something, yeah. something going on there. Um, and you want the eye contact and the connection. Um, mm -hmm. So you said, um, uh, where is this here? Is it on the face? Um, how will, when you got a good look at her face, had she been crying or, or what was her expression? Was it more still distressed or more peaceful? Um, oh, for sure. Distressed. And yeah, looking like she had been crying for a while. Okay. And how did she communicate? Um, you know, would she use the words kiss me or, how did that come across? That was basically it. Like, kiss me, please. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Is that a more, um, you know, so it changed, it varies family to family. Is that a gesture, um, common in your, in your, 
family's culture uh, kiss your mom um really not really oh no. okay no. that was also unusual okay mm -hmm. i often start looking for things like you know uh is it the house from real life or not okay it is and then like is this common behavior from from real life okay if it's not then we start deviating and, and we start looking at well okay why is that different why the opposite of something what what would that be expressing so we're getting there we're getting there with with some of this stuff um and if i might add then sure. uh that wasn't normal for my mom either <laughs> i think i well my mom cried a lot with movies and stuff but i think i've seen my mom cry two or three times because she was distressed you know it my mom cried a lot <laughs> when it came to movies and stuff because, you know, she got emotional from that. And I do, too. It, regular circumstances or if it was her health, I never saw her cry really ever. Maybe two or three times, honestly. That was an ordinary, too. Okay. So she was typically a little more stoic about real-life struggles, but she would let, let the odd tear out when moved by a particular story or circumstance. Uh, Music, yeah. Music, gotcha. Okay, fair enough. For sure. Yeah, because some people dry, uh, cry at everything and the, the drop of a hat, literally. Oh, it's such a pretty hat and it fell. <laughs> look at it. Look at the, the way the light's hitting it. You know, some people, not so much. Um, I mean, I've shed a few tears watching usually the hero moments in movies. The, the My go to mm -hmm. example is um, Spider Man 2, I think it was. Funny example, but uh, he saves the people on the train. And he's about to fall and they catch him and they bring him in hand over hand and they're dead silent and respectful and they lay him down and they're like, he's just a kid. My son's his age. And then the little boy comes up and give him his masks. Here, here's Spider-Man. You drop this. I'm like, oh, I'm balling. That gets me every time. <laughs> this, they're oh, just yeah. so grateful that he, that he risked his life to save him. And, and in awe of his, you know, what he, what he sacrificed to be that, to be that hero. Uh, anyway, that always gets me. Um, so you take her uh, head in your hands and she, you, she says, kiss me, please. And you do, you lean down and plant one on the lips, on the cheek, the forehead. Uh. Um, so for one, it was, it wasn't like immediate. So I held her, her face and it was like, probably like a moment, like a couple, 30 seconds, maybe of us just being there. Sure. And then. Like and then yeah, she asked. She said that and um, we're on the lips, but not like long or romantic. Yeah. <laughs> just a regular peck. I know some people are weird. Uh, and might think yeah, that's yeah. weird, but just on the lips. And again, it's very different. Not nothing that we've ever done before like that. Or uh, it was interesting. Did her demeanor change from distressed in the beginning and tearful to? Uh, as she was requesting the kiss, did, they, did her expression was different at that moment? Was she communicating something else with her expression? I mean, she's, she, uh, I will say she didn't feel as distressed. She didn't feel as emotional. I'm really in trying to remember, because I'm trying to remember if it was emotional or if she was like at a peaceful place and felt peaceful, her saying it. Mm, let me think. That's kind of what I'm looking for. That idea of, you know, she was right. alone and tearful and you, you felt the need to go to her. You felt that's what she wanted. And she did. And you held her hands, uh, head in your hands. Cause you're, you know, you care about her suffering and you know, she's not going to be with you very long. And her, it's kind of like her last request is to give her this kiss right before you wake up. Um, and kind of the way she asked and, and if there was any change of expression, might give a clue to why the kiss was necessary or what it was meant to accomplish. Um, here, 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 cut this out because I'm gonna look at something real quick. Sure, that's fine. Uh, I made a, I made a, I made a post right after that dream. Gotcha. I just want to, just want to read it one more time. Sure. I read it to you. <laughs> That's fine. And I mean, you know, I'll cut it out if you want me to, or I'll, I might leave it in. It's okay to refer to your notes. Uh, that's not a big deal. Yeah, no, I'll read it. We'll keep that in there, but mm -hmm. not where I was looking for it. I said, one of the hardest things about grief is the dreams. The mm -hmm. moment you're slowly coming to terms with your loved one gone, and then you clearly feel and see them. A lucid dream, you don't know what to make of that. Is it comforting, peaceful, or painful? 
saw my mom in a dream recently. I knew she would pass away, so I was always worried. Towards the end, she was hunched over and cried for me. I held her face. She told me to kiss her, so I did that. That moment, a calmness fell over me, and I woke up. And thinking about it, yeah, she was very calming when she asked. Okay. And then you woke up almost immediately, and that feeling of calmness came with you? It was overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like an oxymoron, but overwhelmingly know, calm. Overwhelming sense of calm, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I mean, we, we got right back to the end there, and... Um, <laughs> There's always a little bit more. There's always a few more details. I mean, no one should ever try to give me every possible detail. Uh, tell what you can remember, certainly, but uh, yeah. let the process be what it is. Tell the story. This is what happened, and then we're going to trust we're going to go back through it again, and there's always a little bit more. always takes a little bit longer. So um, yeah. you know, just as an example to folks, short dream, very simple. Standing in a hallway, mom in a room, I kiss her, I wake up. Bing, bang, boom. Uh, but there's actually a lot more there. There always is. Always is. Um, mm -hmm. So I like to pause when I remember, and I try to remember, um, to say now that you've gone through it a couple times and once in much greater detail, did you have any kind of epiphanies or moments during that where you were describing something and something occurred to you like, you know, maybe it's related to this or, you know, you kind of draw your own conclusions as we go. Um, I like to start there um, before I start throwing out ideas and fill in your head with what what, what I think. Mm. I mean, I didn't really share how I felt during the dream. That's a detail I didn't really say. I mean, I felt sad, of course, but I did feel sad. Yeah, the way she felt. I was sad she's gonna pass soon or whenever I just knew she was but yeah i think if i felt anything else, i don't even think i i don't know if i was worried i just was sad it was like a felt pretty bleak but but being near her was comforting though even though i was apparently in the dream comforting her i felt comforted for sure yeah, and uh, so I didn't pry too much, and it's okay to say, did, did she pass suddenly, or was it a, you kind of knew it was coming, and it took its toll, and it eventually happened, or it was like automobile accident uh, or cancer, you know, that kind of thing? Uh, suddenly. So, we were prepared for it. Gotcha. So, okay. No, the, then those I, are two different I know you're going to have your interpretation, but I'm just... It feels like, like just going through it, it just felt like, it felt like these are the things that I wanted more. Yeah. Be there for her more, to comfort her more, to see her more vulnerable. And so I kind of do wish I knew she was going to pass before. I didn't, I always, I don't think it's better someone passes suddenly or not. But for me, I would have wanted to know. So I feel like that's what the dream was in a way. Even the whole like, uh, I said that I couldn't see anything else. Everything was dark but her, the light. And it felt like it was always my light or my brightest light. So I definitely want to hear what you have to say, but just reiterating it and revisiting it, I'm feeling like that. It's yeah. kind of like what it was I was experiencing. <clears throat> I, I think you're going pretty much exactly the place I was going to start putting together. And this is why I stop and ask people, because sometimes it's just the experience of telling the story again to someone, having a little probing questions that kind of fill in some of those details and really help mm. you see the different angles. It, it starts to come together in your own mind. And my interpretation of the kiss, the, the first thing I thought of is like the final kiss, the kiss goodbye that that yeah. being a, an expression we're all familiar with. Um, so I don't, you know, I, certainly I'm not going a Freudian route and saying, well, this is obviously sexual with your mother and you'll get to the root of it. No, that's the root of it, I think, <laughs> is is the, the idea of you didn't even get to kiss her goodbye. It was sudden. She was mm -hmm. gone. Like, not even that 
kiss goodbye is possible anymore. So you put it in the dream. But I think it's both. It go, I think it goes both directions. You know, it's you expressing that. But what she 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 asked you to kiss her as in kiss me goodbye, like let me go in a sense, but also to give you something to transmit through that uh, uh, ceremonial uh, gesture of parting to pass along to you the calmness uh, that you woke up with. That, that 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 was something that needed to be expressed by a very intimate form of contact um, that is completely asexual. So that, I'm not even going anywhere near that in the dream because I don't think it's relevant. Uh, 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 yeah, for sure. And and um, uh, so you, I think you're definitely onto it. Um, here's here's what I do with this type of stuff. I I uh, make notes like you know what is what is a hallway? And, and a lot of, a lot of people talk to me about hallways and dreams and sometimes they're long hallways in cathedral type buildings. I mean, there's many different types of hallways, mm. but a hallway in a home is, mm. you know, your home is a very specific kind of place. That's again, intimate. There's a few things more personal than this is where I live. This is where I keep my stuff. This is where the people I care about are close to me, but hallways are often transitional spaces. There's nothing in a hallway. A hallway exists to, let you gain entry to other places to leave your room and get out the front door to get to your room or another room from another room. Uh, so there's always transitional. So you awaken your dream in this, in this transitional space. And why would you put yourself there and not in your own bedroom, not in the garage, yeah. not in the backyard. You put yourself like I am in, I'm going through, something. I'm in a temporary place. I'm in a place that only exists to lead me somewhere else. So all of this, just from the idea that you start in the hallway, and it's, it's a very iconic thing that I latch onto a lot when, when folks talk about that. Now, if I ever say things like that and you're like, I don't feel it, that doesn't make any sense to me. Feel free. But, uh, I, I think it's a good place to, to start with the, at the introduction of the dream. But I didn't, I didn't even think about it either. Like what, like I thought about, of course, the moment with my mom. I didn't think about why was I in a hallway, and it, and again, the it's gonna sound weird, but as I said before, I think gates. I think gates. I think dreams are gateways, sure. and it seemed like the hallway was almost a gateway to another place. Like you said, you like yeah. you know hallways to get you somewhere else. Um, and doorways are portals <laughs> that lead to other places for sure. Uh, I think in that moment, even though in the dream I was in a reality where my mom was alive, I still was going to a new place. And that's why I think the dream was really cathartic for me, because, because of that and just everything. And even though it was reality, it felt really heavenly in a way. I love what you said about the final kiss goodbye, because like I said, I didn't get that. Um, and oh, I was going to say something else, something that I thought interesting oh, i don't remember i'll remember but it is interesting starting the dream in the hallway i didn't think of it that way though yeah, now i do <laughs> transitional transitional space uh it's, you're on a you're on a journey and it's it's like um i'm moving from one place to another and it's temporary and when i get where i'm going it's not going to be the same as where it was mm. there's, there's all these ideas mm. packed around it um well i do, oh, I do say, remember now sorry oh, go ahead i do remember now i think also part of the part of it this is kind of going forward though but just just because these were my, my thoughts i'm thinking i feel like my mom was always the supporter of all of us in my family, uh, and I don't think I wish I was able to offer her more. I don't know if I did or not, um, but my mom and I had a good relationship. Um, but you know, you always you always have those thoughts of what could I have done more. And this is what I wanted to do more of comforting her, either for her like she was for me. I think that was part of it too. I feel like the, I feel like the dream is just what I was. What I really desired her being here, everything, which I find really interesting. Yeah, for for sure, and that's definitely uh, you know. So for Freud, uh, not everything was sexual. It was, but it wasn't. But what he also talked about was the the idea of pure wish fulfillment dreams, which this mm -hmm. has an element of that to it, uh, which I want to get to in just a moment. But I want to give a respectful nod, at least, to the idea of dreams being gateways supernatural who knows uh that's a very ancient idea and has a long tradition in you know going back to greek and you know pre pre-greek and roman times 
uh, but also mm-hmm. in a lot of uh, native tribal traditions. They think, you know, maybe your soul leaves your body when you go to sleep and goes on adventures. And that's what, that's what a dream is. Um, I don't dismiss it, but I don't know how to work with that. Like that's not my specialty. Uh, what I try to acknowledge is I know the psychological side of things and how it might relate to your real life and processing emotions and trying to problem solve. So I go with that direction, but there are multiple chapters in one of my many books, um, that actually talk about dreams of the dead and what does it mean? I mean, it goes back to the, uh, uh, the ghost of Patroclus visiting uh, Achilles in his tent uh, during during the mm. siege of Troy. I mean, there's ancient stories about how these apparitions or our experience of them informs our decisions. And I think I think that was a a point in the in the in the um, siege of Troy where Achilles had to make a decision, and the ghost came, came visited him in a dream, and he woke up knowing what he wanted to do in a way, uh, which is a lot of what dreams do for us. They, you know, give us the opportunity to process in the background while we shut off all the external stimuli. Um, uh, okay. So I promise I get around to the idea of the uh, Freudian uh, concept of wish fulfillment dreams. A lot of times we would like something in our waking life. We go, I, I'm missing a thing. I wish to acquire a thing. I, you know, and specifically if it's, man, I wish my mom was still here. And mm-hmm. I wish at the very least, you know, that I could see her again and that I could properly say goodbye. So that to me makes a tremendous amount of sense of why this dream would come to you, what, why you would experience it, why you would uh, let yourself have that experience. Cause it was something you kind of mm-hmm. needed to think through. Um, what if I had that opportunity? How would it go? Um, you know, and, and by experiencing it in your sleep, you get this, closure in a way that allows you to wake up perfectly calm and just sit in that feeling of like, it's okay. I I don't have to hurt as bad as I usually do about this. I can just be okay with it for a minute. And, Um, you know, like you were saying, I I knew that she was okay. And, uh, that's, there's few things in life that are better than just being content with whatever is happening because, the alternative is you're suffering. Uh, you're, you're unhappy about it in some way. Now it's contentment is not excitement or, or the novelty. It's, 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 its own different. It's, it's just, okay. Things are just okay. Most of our life is just trying to be okay <laughs> from a day to day basis. Um, so I don't know. I said a lot. I'll g- give you a moment to b- b- add your two cents. Yeah. I also will share. Mm-hmm. I told you I felt at peace after, but I feel like I learned something through that too. Not not just like you know, my desires or what I like that wishful thinking of what I would have always wanted. I'm realizing that more now. <laughs> but what I realize is because I believe in the afterlife, and I think we tend to kind of believe the afterlife is a heavenly place where people are at this utmost peace. I don't think so. <laughs> I think that it exists, but I think that they experience emotions maybe even more severe because they're more enlightened, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, I realized at that point, I was like, my mom is telling me to be okay, but also she's saying that she does miss me, that they can grieve too. They grieve the life they lost. They grieve us because they can't be with us. I learned that after that dream too. I was like, we're always so focused on our grieving and the people alive, but and not everyone believes in the afterlife, but I do, and that they grieve us too, and they want us to live our best life as well, and don't want us to be, well, I say they, I say my mom mostly. Even my grandpa recently kind of said that he spoke to my mom, you know, uh, like last week, and that, you know, she prays for us every day, she prays for us every day, and wants us to live a good life and be happy. I know that's kind of vague, but, you know, I don't know what else he would tell someone. Sure. Um, so no, yeah, and interesting. I the lesson I learned after that. <clears throat> yeah, no, and I, did, I didn't quite go far enough in in some of the stories. Let me. Uh, so there's lots and lots of stories of people reporting personal experiences with deceased relatives that come back to let them know let them know things. I've never had that experience, but. I could. I mean, it's one of those things where like, if it happened to me, I would know exactly what it was here. I'm getting secondhand stories. I don't think people are lying to me. Um, I don't know what to make of it. That that's, that's where I'm at with it. It's like, I believe you. I don't know what the hell that is. Um, but you are not alone in thinking that there's actually a, it's kind of a grand tradition of the dead returning to comfort the living in a way to say, 
I'm still out here. I'm sorry you're having a hard time. Maybe my presence can make it easier on you a little bit. And who's to say? I mean, I, I don't I don't really know. I mean, if that's your belief system, then it's it would be unsurprising to draw comfort from that to say, hey, she came back to just be with me one more time and and let me know that everything was okay. And yes, she misses me, but here, have my have this has have this gift of calm to wake up with so that you can just be okay. Uh, that's probably the number one thing she'd want for you to just be, just don't, just don't hurt because of me. Be okay. Be calm. Be, you know, enjoy, and, enjoy that feeling. I know. And I love your, how you're saying this because you're saying, I believe in the afterlife or dreams or gateways. I'm not saying that as objective truths. Cause again, I'm actually going to admit, I don't know either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, I don't think we're going to know until we, to that threshold really and we're all going to that's all i can say we're all going to get there i love that because there are people that will rule it out and for me it's like that brings me comfort that there's an afterlife but again i don't know um but I, I think it's important in context to the dream because these are my thoughts and my beliefs in the dream yeah. um and i think that it's not necessarily we're not obviously proving if that stuff exists or not but i think it does impact the dream itself because of what my beliefs are and how i feel and how I came out of it and like what I learned from it. I hope that makes sense. For sure. No. And that's why, uh, uh, you know, I talk to people. I'm getting better at it too. Talk to them a little bit beforehand, get a sense of where they're coming from, their personality, kind of how they think about things. You know, it's, uh, I'm not getting a full psychological profile. I'm not even, you know, analyzing people as much as just, <laughs> let me get to know how this person thinks a little bit and what's their story and how they, how they just describe themselves and what they've been through. And then I start trying to apply that to, their circumstance and what they're going through in the dream and how that might relate. And then you ask a bunch more questions, but as I've said many, many times in the past, I think it's true. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what my belief structure is. I'm not the one having the dream. You know, it's gotta be a product of what you think, what you feel, what you believe. And then we go from there. Um, what was I saying? Uh, it was a good example I was using the other day of like, um, no, nah, I'm not, I got nothing. I, I had it for a moment. They're like, Oh, it's a great example. And I lost it. <laughs> I think you get the idea. I don't need to over explain it. I always do that too. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> no, no, but I love it. It's very fascinating. Oh, Oh, it is endlessly. I never, I'm never bored by a single one of these experiences. Um, I'm wondering if there's more to pull out of it. I mean, we got the, I think we got the broad strokes, we got the story arc, like whether or not this was a f- visitation from beyond the grave. Um, it is an experience you had while you were asleep and it seems to make sense from both sides. You know, this would be consistent with your mom's character when she was alive to want to offer you comfort. And it's also entirely plausible that it, this is a wish fulfillment experience that you needed to have to imagine the opportunity to say goodbye at all. Uh, that, like that's a big deal giving yourself that. Um, I was just wondering if there were other, specifics that might give you more insight into how you're processing the grief or uh, a way to make it easier to live with. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think anything else jumps off the page at me. Oh, I felt like a, <laughs> You know, dreams can be very vague, but this one, going through it, it seems really crystal clear what it was, honestly. Right? After the fact, once once we kind of get a chance to talk about it, I love that. Yeah. I love that, too, where it's like, I have no idea what you're going to say, but you, anybody who's a guest, and you're bringing me something where you're like, I don't quite understand what this is. And then we just start looking at it together, and all of a sudden it's like, would you look at that? There, that That's it? That's, that's exactly what it is. And that unfolding process that that mystery solving moment uh the whole process is just i love it it's endlessly fascinating to me (laughs) oh very very interesting you know i think this is super exciting and what i I, what i do find really interesting like you said before about dreams is i'm actually doing a speech later today about how to tap into your imagination i think dreams are interesting because i think that even though still operating in a way from our reality but i think that's a place where there's no bar- barriers at all your imagination just kind of runs wild and it's i find it really interesting 
Well, yeah, that's kind of the example I was going to use earlier is that things don't have to make sense in dreams. It doesn't matter if you can fly, you're flying, uh, th that, that kind of a thing. So it doesn't have to be directly related to your, what's possible in the physical world. Actually, sometimes the, the impossible things have their own type of meaning to it that makes it more interesting or, or gives relevant clues to what's going on in other areas. Why, why could you fly here, but not here? Well, what's the difference about those two and what does flying mean to you? That kind of, that kind of a thing. So anyway, um, well, if you think we got a pretty good answer for you, um, I'm good to wrap it up and uh, let you get back to preparing for, for your class. I have one question, though. Sure. Uh, does timing impact dreams or the interpretation of them? Like, I didn't have this dream right when she passed. It was a year and a half later. I wonder if, I don't remember how I was feeling that moment, if I needed something like that. I don't remember yeah. Is that a thing? Like, is timing important too? I, I think it is very much. Um, so sometimes we don't have an idea right away. If you think about it, like, um, or, or sometimes we don't understand what we need right away sometimes. Uh, so giving it, giving something time to pass. And sometimes we're being patient to let things resolve naturally on their own and, um, so sometimes it takes us a long time to get to an understanding of something and then it'll pop up in a dream. Uh, and sometimes we're being patient with the process and then we get frustrated with waiting and that'll cause a dream to pop up. Um, sometimes circumstance very, and very often circumstances will happen in real life where we might have a fleeting, fleeting thought in the middle of the day wish I gotten a chance to say goodbye to my mom. And then the busy day takes us over and we're here, there, we're everywhere and going around. And then later at night, that little tiny thought that we had for a millisecond, mm. just mm. an emotional response to something, you know, you saw mom pushing a stroller with her kid. Oh, mom's yeah. busy day. I got other things to think about gone from your mind completely. And then that emotion kind of bubbles up in sleep and something you didn't even remember happened during the daytime is kind of the, ultimate uh. trigger for the entire experience. Well, let me, let me have that experience or let me see what I would, what would that look like if I were able to have it? Uh, yeah. Mm. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it does. No, it does. No, it's really interesting. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah, but other than that, yeah, we can definitely wrap up. Good deal. Okay. No, I, I love this and I appreciate your time. And well, we're going to do the, uh, end of the show stuff here. Let me say, uh, once again, uh, big thanks to our friend Zane Landon out of California, uh, mental health advocate, publisher of the Positive Vibes magazine and recent attendee at the Youth Mental Health Action Forum at the White House. Uh, you can find him at, uh, at Zane Landon, L-A-N-D-I-N, on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Links in the description below. And uh, for my part, would you kindly like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Always need more volunteer dreamers and uh, viewers and whatnot. Uh, 15 currently available works of historical dream literature. The most recent book, 15, The World of Dreams by Havelock, uh, Havelock Ellis. Too many L's in that name. I gotta let them get tongue tied. Um, also, you can stop on by BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. Uh, you'll find uh, MP3 versions of all these interviews, a uh, complete list of all the books, a growing encyclopedia, some other stuff I can never remember, list of all my social media and alternative, uh, uh, what do you call it? Alternative tech platform engagement. Yeah. Okay. That's enough. I get a t-shirt like this. Hey, there you go. Coffee mugs. And that's enough shilling out of me. Just uh, once again, uh, Zane, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much again. I love doing this. Good deal. And everybody out there, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>